It's a Galaxy S8 world, and we're just living in it. We're going to run down our early coverage of Samsung's newest, hottest phone. And plus, we're seeing more Android Wear updates getting pushed out to smartwatches, and Xiaomi is making a little noise with their next generation of phones, too. These stories plus your viewer emails, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 249 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Now, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and the most exciting news you'd see about galaxies was watching reruns of Cosmos on PBS. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at PocketNow.com, blasting the signal from sunny Southern California, joined this week, as always, by plucky podcast producer Jules Wong. How's it going out there on the East the Coast? The personalities behind Cosmos are just awesome. I mean, we had the first, you had Sagan really first, is. and then freaking Tyson just goes in and just drops mics everywhere. Well, and also, and, and ridiculously awesome that that was produced by, uh, what's his name from Family Guy, Seth, uh, <laughs> yeah. Seth. McFarland. Uh, Woo! I almost forgot that guy's name. A terrible casting director here in Los Angeles, if I can't remember that guy's name. <laughs> but before we jump into too much of the tech tomfoolery and all of the fun conversations that we're apt to get into on this podcast, we do have to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, and that is Blue Apron. And we get it. You're busy. But that doesn't mean you don't have time to put together interesting meals using high-quality ingredients. A Blue Apron takes the guesswork out of cooking, delivering the exact amounts of food you need for each recipe. No joke. I put one together last night. It needed one scallion. I had one scallion in the box. And all ingredients, meats and vegetables, are sourced ethically using sustainable sources. And those, so and those sources are often very close to you, supporting local farmers in your area. Meals are delivered to 99% of the continental United States, and the costs are under $10 per serving. Now, I actually have recipe cards up here with me. Some of the meals that are coming out this month, uh, Swiss chard and potato shakshuka with uh, sweet peppers and garlic toast. We've got mole spiced beef chili with a russet potato and lime creme fraiche. And spicy chicken sandwiches with Alabama white sauce and roasted sweet potatoes. We put this one together last night and it was delicious. These re recipe cards are phenomenal because they have like this full rundown of everything that you need to do to put the, the recipe together and all of the ingredients that you're going to use from the Blue Apron packaging. Um, putting together rich, flavorful meals shouldn't be stressful or intimidating, so that kind of documentation is always a nice touch. Each week, you can customize your menu to fit your particular tastes, dietary restrictions, including vegetarian options. Blue Apron has an extensive collection of recipes, so subscribers won't encounter the same meal twice over the course of a year unless requested. Cooking together can help improve family bonds, and Blue Apron families cook together three times more often. And my little daughter is absolutely fascinated by me throwing around pots and pans. I throw her in her high chair. I start cooking in the kitchen and she also gets to kind of sample and taste some of the things that I'm putting together. Um, it's a fun way to bond over food and often her favorite Disney songs. So you will love how good it feels to... It, how you will love how good it feels and tastes. This is their their end cap. This is why I'm kind of stumbling on this to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free by going to blueapron.com slash pocket now. Again, blueapron.com slash pocket now for your first three meals on us. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Week. You will love how feels it good. Good. <laughs> I was just like I was getting ahead of myself and like and uh yeah I, I kind of I, I I didn't stick the landing unfortunately but we've been using Blue Apron for a little while it's a nice way we we kind of use it as a way to fill in fill in the gaps on our weekly cooking and meal yeah. prep um and it is it's really great for three of us one of us is a little baby that when we get the meals for two that's enough food for all three of us to eat so that's just kind of a nice little uh little side bend, you know, like a little insider info there. I don't know. The blue apron wants you to know about that. But, you know, that's what <laughs> that, we found. That, if you've got a toddler, they tend to not eat as much as a full grown adult. No, they, <laughs> they don't. And that's why you should probably, um, get, you know, baby food. Yeah. That's, that's a thing that's, you should, I, get. you know what I really thought, you know, you have this idea of what babies do. And I really thought she was going to be eating baby food a lot longer. Nope. She's like, she eats the same things as we do. Apparently toddlers are also people. Who knew? I mean, yeah, they're humans too. They, they grow up to be inconceivably weird, like 
beings and that usually starts <laughs> around um toddler age so yeah i mean what it, yeah right about yeah. now oh man so you probably <laughs> already like introduced her to pistachio uh ingrained salami and and you'll just be infecting her with other kinds of um weirdness I haven't gotten there gotten there yet, but apparently my daughter is a big fan of uh, sweet and mild curries. Oh, okay. She really likes Indian food. Okay. That's good. I have no idea where that came from because you don't you don't I'm, have I'm, Indian, you don't have Thai, Indian you don't have person. like even like the Japanese or Chinese uh, styles. It was more just like what we thought we would be exposing her to, and that like you know flavor combo. Even a very mild curry is a very powerful flavor. You know, yeah. like we weren't expecting her to really gravitate towards that. But, you know, we we sat down at this Indian place and she's just going to town on a korma <laughs> and she's got these other like little dipping sauces and stuff. And you're like, wow, she's it, 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 she's it ahead of the, the curve there. T- tickly and, and tingle and all, you know, it, it feels nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm glad that we're able to freely <laughs> and... talk about this thing now that we have a specific space in our in our agenda to do so. Yes. We're 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 trying a, a little format shift on how we we normally go about talking about tech news and some of the things that we're working on here at Pocket Now. So hopefully this is this is a, a fun way to consume the Pocket Now uh, podcast. Although technically, and it's also I mean for those of you listening. Oh, go technically ahead. Technically, the the segment hasn't even started yet. I still have to get through like the the new news digest thing that we were doing. Yes. Now, so. We we should probably save that, but it's also for those of you, you know, the little behind the scenes here. Like Jules and I only really get to talk once a week, so part of the podcast is you all just having to deal with the fact that this is how we catch yeah. up. <laughs> like this is how we, you know, this is like our work exactly. conversation. This is our water cooler. Like chat. I, I get to talk to Quan about my kids as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. I wish. Um, okay, maybe I should adopt. Anyways, um, I'll just go through the news and we'll talk again in four minutes whether or not we would like to talk about uh, chicken korma curry. Uh, but let's uh, let's just get through the news here. And uh, we start with the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus as some Korean users who are just getting their hands on the devices say that their screens have odd red tints to them. Samsung says the issue should not be a quality control one and can be adjusted within the device if users aren't satisfied, they can hike over to a service center. Plenty of new hardware up ahead as well. This week was Xiaomi's turn as it introduced the flagship Mi 6 to China. We're talking about a Snapdragon 835, 6 gigs of RAM, stereo speakers, dual cameras, and a very glossy or a very ceramic design and a price starting above $360. Sales commence April 28. A few days prior to that, we're tracking LG's embarrassing track record in Europe. Continuing on with the G6, apparently 24 countries in the continent will have to wait until at least Monday, that's April 24, for the phone to launch. That's after debuts in Korea, the US, Canada, Australia earlier this month. Mind you, Galaxy S8 orders are shipping right now, and um, similar uh, availability problems have been uh, told of the V20 and other phones, so that's not good. Beyond that, we see invitations that are out for us to squeeze for the brilliant you and they uh those are from htc pocket now has been tracking a phone code named ocean with a pressure sensing you uh basically it's like the side bezels uh tentatively named edge sense so we can expect to learn more about that on may 16. To the summer now, and Sharp's newest phone, it looks like a Samsung flagship of old, but it brings a Snapdragon 835 to the company's decidedly mid-range lineup. It's calling it the Aquas R. It's being paired up with a funky Robocall, an intelligent swiveling charge base. Expect to hear more from the Foxconn-owned OEM soon about that. Late May will be when the last legacy Android Wear smartwatch gets updated to Android Wear 2.0. If you have a Moto 360, Huawei Watch, or some other eligible device uh, that hasn't been updated yet, you may be lucky to see the update coming at the end of this month. But time will tell. LG Display is reported to be making OLED screens for the Xiaomi uh, Mi Note, the next Mi Note device, and potentially for LG Electronics' own V30 coming later uh, later this year. The company is still prying itself away from LCD manufacturing, though, which may still be fuel for a contract with Apple to provide for the iPhone 7S, um, 
excuse me, the 7S, which is not the fancier iPhone 8 coming out simultaneously. Speaking of that iPhone 8, could go without Touch ID. Multiple stories you can check out at our website claim that Apple might omit the tech altogether, put a sensor at the back, and uh, this is the least likely situation it seems. Successfully implement one below the display. There have been trials about that. We'll get back to you as soon as developments uh, occur. Finally, on the carrier side, Sprint is now offering global roaming data at LTE speeds. For its unlimited plan users, it's free in Canada and Mexico. Most elsewhere for all customers, except in China, where it's more expensive, it's $5 daily and $25 a week. T-Mobile offers a maximum speed of up to 256 kilobits per second. That's included with their T-Mobile One Plus plan at $75, which is second tier above the basic tier. And that is all the news. You can see full details on these stories and more. Hit pocketnow.com and look for the podcast section to get to this episode's rundown. So, with all that said, what you feeling this week? What, like, there's been... I, mean, I, I kind of wanted to backtrack just real quick on the news front. Yeah, no, this um, is, I mean, we can pick one we can of the pick stories. This. Yeah, let's. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so so one of the things like I, I the, the Xiaomi announcement that they're going to be partnering with LG mm-hmm. was for me one of the more exciting, quieter stories in uh, in the rundown on Pocket Now right now because we haven't seen LG in the phone space with an OLED panel since the yeah. Flex. And in fact, I was just commenting on this with someone. We were in a conversation on one of the YouTube videos for the Galaxy S8. You know, like, it's really a shame that the last Flex got saddled with such a crap Qualcomm processor, um, that first generation, the first batch of those Qualcomm 810s, um, because the the screen was on point. I mean, it was a great step in the right direction for some competition for Samsung in the OLED space. And it's, it, you know, it's kind of a bummer that we haven't seen LG try anything like that yeah, they, again even if you don't have a bendy phone you could still put an oled on a g series or a v yeah, series i was kind of um kind of bummed that we haven't seen more in the plastic oled um developments because they've been working on that for the flex um apparently not faring too terribly well for uh phones i guess but they have been using them in their smart watches yeah. so um uh, maybe it's oh, just yeah. because of that the the size characteristics or something within that system that really works out that plastic OLED is uh, more feasible for smartwatches than smartphones. But I mean, it's still an LCD. now. Do you think Xiaomi's going to go with the plastic OLED, or do you think we're going to take some of that OLED sheet and put glass on top of it for a more traditional? I'm not phone sure feel? if this is the active matrix kind that we're talking about here. It just they they say OLED. Gotcha. Um, the sources uh, don't really uh, go through with that. This was sourced from the uh, the investor, and it was like a couple of agencies that um, compiled this report. So, uh, yeah, it's a going. I mean, LG has lots of competition. Ninety five percent. Uh, I think is the key statistic here uh, of uh, OLED. The OLED market for smartphones is from Samsung. And China yeah. is starting to get into things too. A couple of its suppliers are uh, ramping up uh, factories. Uh, hopefully they can get multiple hundreds of thousands of units per month instead of the tawdry uh, 37,000 <laughs> per month. I mean, right. like, the, the, the one of the odd things that uh, I was worried about when we were talking about the iPhone, uh, OLED iPhone, Back then, we didn't know it was going to yeah. be either this year or next year. But uh, is that like we, we kept seeing numbers like in the tens of thousands per month. And even with that going all the way from like 18, 20, 24 months back, that was only going yeah. to provide, you know, a couple million uh, units at best when we're talking about a phone that would uh, take a huge portion of the 200 to 300 million that Apple would sell yeah. in iPhones that year. So, um, yeah. Now, do we think that that's still on point? Like if we're talking about a more traditional iPhone 8 launch and then an iPhone premium, that because it would be a more expensive iPhone and a bit more of a specialty item, oh, that yeah. they'd be able to keep the numbers of sales lower to match sort of OLED production I don't know on I that mean, end I mean does that make it, sense it, it should make sense in in real world as in like 
the place that you and I live in. But market analysts, (laughs) the high street banks are just like, okay, so this is probably going to take, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of, uh, you know, uh, new model production this year, as opposed to the boring drab old iPhone 7S, which is also going to be beside it, maybe the 7S Plus. Um, We did a story about LG Display perhaps being very interested in uh, taking the LCD contracts for uh, those two phones. So, ah, that I would mean, make sense. Yeah. This is um, a trial period. This is a transition period. This is uh, definitely a rough time. And it's going to be uh, certainly interesting to see which any of these manufacturers will be able to make the most dent against Samsung. So, you know, in speaking of Samsung and screens, um, we could probably start shifting yeah. over into our our actual Galaxy S8 coverage stuff. But to backtrack to your very first story, I don't think this is going to show up on my crappy web camera here. Mm-hmm. But if you set the Galaxy S... Yeah, this is Ooh, way too bright. Look at that. Um, if you set the Galaxy S8 to basic mode... Now, on the S7... That actually delivered, I think, the most accurate screen tone ever measured at at the time by a smartphone if you set it to basic. That was from a DisplayMate, Now, if I set it to... Yeah, from from DisplayMate. And and I might be misremembering that. So someone please correct me down in the comments if I'm wrong because I didn't pull up any kind of show notes for this. (laughs) Um, But if I switch the S8 into basic mode, um, the output is pretty warm yeah that is, that is kind of reddish or yeah, kind of brownish compared to and it's you know th- i mean so... we've seen this in other uh amoled units from uh the one i remember is the i think it was the moto uh the, no the nexus 6 uh from motorola yeah, that yeah yeah very pronounced um you know it, it could go down really low it's all it always seems like you know like you know we made the point of mentioning the low light uh, capabilities where it just drops down to one nit and you can it's perfect for low light right. reading and all that and it's also but it also has this red tint which you know it's sacrifice but you know it also has that kind of indirect um benefit of a uh, blue light reduction i guess maybe so it's yeah you know better for that so that's not with any kind of eye filter or anything on either that's taking it at its most basic like there shouldn't be any color processing happening on that screen and it seems like that display is naturally a little on the warmer side something uh just kind of curious i mean like we never we didn't really get the true rgb stripe we didn't get the 4k display there are a lot of things about this and shifting the form factor that i think samsung has kind of slow played on the rest of the phone but reading that story you know like that's kind of a bummer i'm going to go back and go into an adaptive brightness and color mode now just because i don't like the look of that warm <laughs> tint on 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 my phone screen whereas on my s7 i used that almost exclusively in basic mode because i felt it really was the most accurate for when i was shooting photos and taking video so that's that's kind of an I odd mean, spot. Like it would be an, an odd transition for for from one phone generation to the next. I, I, maybe it's that uh, one of the more uh, outlandish theories that I've just thought of this second is um, that we are looking at like you know <laughs> long. I think infrared is shorter wavelengths, right? No wait, that no wait. Yeah, no, it'd be longer because more frequently is the blue and then the ultraviolet and all that stuff. So if it's shorter, doesn't that uh, don't they um, uh, like convey themselves uh, longer or like farther than uh, blues uh, usually? Because it... well, yeah, I mean, if we're talking like Roy G. Biv, then yeah, reddish tones are longer wavelengths. Yeah, of light so I, I'm not what little what high little school high school physics, physics. Like, looking through the prism <laughs> and then that's it. Um, so like may, maybe <laughs> right. it's just the reds that are really pronouncing themselves in just a given like neutral situation. I'm not exactly sure of that, but you know, I mean, it's what we've seen in other devices. So um, maybe it's just a rule of thumb. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to see other people's thoughts like if there's so so here would be, I think, the one thing that would make an actual difference in my opinion of the phone. If there's a disparity in the consistency of color tone from other Galaxy S8 units, then that makes me a little nervous about Samsung's QA. If all if this panel design really is sort of structured and it's a little bit warmer naturally and they're using some sort of adaptive code. 
um, out of the box to make it whatever brightness or whiteness that you want, then I'm not I'm not concerned by that at all. I mean, this is a consumer facing phone. This isn't sort of a professionally calibrated device. We're not looking at the same kind of accuracy we would expect from a graphic design tablet or something like that. Um, but if if this is an inconsistent issue with panels, then we know that Samsung's got some issues in fulfilling orders from the manufacturing side in trying to keep all On the other hand, straight. that opening scene from American Beauty is going to be lovely on that phone. <laughs> or, or, you know, just like, you know, I'll always fire up the scene of the floating plastic bag because it's the most beautiful thing I've the, ever the, seen. The, the thank yous on that bag are going to be really <sighs> popping at you. This is this is my interpretive dance version of the <laughs> plastic bags. So oh far. man, our listeners miss out on so much, don't they? <laughs> the audio version of this show is the worst. Indeed, <laughs> we're, we're sorry to you. Uh, let, let's let's talk more about the holistic um, aspect of the yeah, Galaxy S8. And um, we let's. I mean, do you have the box with you? We can. I can pad out if you need to, and uh, oh. we can talk about the boxing <gasps> experience. Whoa! Look at that! Look at that desk. All the way back over there. Look, it's a black box, yeah. and it's uh, interesting looking. Uh, uh, let me let me just you put this more uh, in front of my face. I, it it is a very yeah. stark. That's the retail packaging boxing. design. I mean, um, yeah this this isn't this isn't the super awesome. Uh, are you jealous of Jaime? that Jaime got? A little bit. I mean, he got his phones before me, so I'm only going into my second day of of getting to play with this phone but not only did he get his phones before me he also got the super awesome mega like i think it also came with the gear vr the new gear vr or something like that and i didn't get to play with any of that i went straight into reviewing the mm. audio stuff so uh you know that's you gotta uh, get I, down I to business you gotta of... you gotta pay 99.99 for that extra on-air treatment with the I actually haven't seen this whole video, so I'm trying not to be distracted. But I am like looking I, in this, you know, as he's unboxing with the, with the box styrofoam and the huge, oversized, like w super wide box. That um, you know, I mean, it's it's there on our YouTube page. It's there on Pocket Now, and it includes everything that is mm -hmm. uh, bundled with the pre-orders. Well, at least the Gear VR and the with the controller that we see on screen right yeah. now. Um, that looks pretty. Um, pretty uh quality stuff and then there's the extra uh the on-ear level here earphones that are paired with a 256 uh, gigabyte yeah. uh sd card for 99 extra dollars if you choose to uh these things started chipping out today technically uh so they stopped pre-orders or like like forced down pre-orders uh, on uh, april 17 and then moved them uh moved started mm -hmm. moving shipments T-Mobile actually started uh, shipping them out on Monday on the 18th. So that continues yeah. their early streak going for them. And, um, you know, overall, like, you, you get the feel that they're nice. It's 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 a nice um thing for reviewers. Yeah, to... well, that's a nice that's a nice way to unbox a phone, and and I'm definitely uh, yeah, All I'm right. I'm super jealous. Like especially let's get, let's get the, the boring edition. Of, what uh, what about Juan? Juan, what, what's so? I I really don't want to do this because this is going to take up too much time. It's going to be horrible <laughs> and not not interesting at all. But what what is the <laughs> unboxing experience for you? Uh, so it's, well, it's terrible right now because like over there on the floor is the charger and the cable. So you get a charger and a cable. So that's pretty spiffy. Immediately goes um, to And the then floor. you also, do, I, yeah, really. And then just throw it right on the floor. I mean, just spike it like a football. Um, you do get the micro USB adapter. So for your existing micro USB cables, you can convert them to USB-C. Um, I really do like this trend of Samsung including an OTG adapter for a full-sized USB port. So uh, it's supposed to be used, the, the idea is that you use it for mm -hmm. transferring your data from another phone, but keep it because it'll also plug into cameras, it'll plug into USB flash drives. It's a nice little handy add-on as we tr try to keep our phones, we start treating our phones more like pocketable computers. And then, of course, you do get the... Uh, the premium earbuds that will retail for ninety nine dollars we'll separate a few from the phone, which which we're going to talk about. Notice I didn't say that they're AKG <laughs> headphones. Um, you get the premium earbuds. Uh, that's a teaser for what we're going to talk about here in just a bit, and that's that's what comes in the box. Um, I think this is this is a well 
uh, a well accessorized device. I'd really love for Samsung to include some kind of clip on or snap on protective backplate like we've been seeing from Huawei. I've been a huge fan of Huawei adding that last little piece of accessory. And I think it would come in clutch to have just a clear soft plastic shield that can go on the back of your Galaxy S8 because this is still one of my biggest complaints with this oh, era oh, of man. all glass phones. So, um, uh, you've you've seen um Dom uh, no, no I keep thinking of Lamberti but he's not Dom Esposito, uh, his video on that. Oh on yeah, the two piece thing. Yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> $20, the best well, and, and $20 just, like, watching for him, two pieces. Watching him like, the go memes through those. And, and, the, and, the, yeah. and the roasts and everything. Yeah, those are. Well, and, and, and like just hilarious, like the worst case you can find for yeah, the Galaxy you know, He's seen grandmas <laughs> better with better bikinis on. So like, there you go. Ugh. Oh, man. Well, that's, I'll have to take his word on you're it. Not not in the, in, well, you're not interested hunting. in the, well, you're not interested in the case. Well, yeah, I'm not interested in that case, but, case. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it it should be it should be disclosed that for all of our coverage, uh, our Galaxy S8 coverage is sponsored by dbrand and the Galaxy S8 that I got, we did put on a dbrand skin just to get a couple vanity shots for uh, for the ads, which I don't even think we're using, which is mm. kind of a bummer. But it, I was kind of sad taking the skin off. I liked having a better tactile yeah. grip on the back of the phone. Um, and, and like, as soon as we're done with this podcast, I'm going to be outside again to shoot more for the real camera review. And I'm really anxious about holding this thing out in public. Cause you know, like, I'm the one who's rolling around in the dirt. I'm holding it over freeway <laughs> overpasses. Like I, I cram, I try to cram weeks worth of shooting into a couple days. So it's a really aggressive, uh, photo schedule to get all of the setups that so we you're like jogging to, to show around. Off you're you're running with the review. with the crab pincers as well uh, sometimes because you got to get the right aspect ratio. <laughs> well, not the right a- aspect ratio, but you I, know. orientation. I, I like it's 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 the same it's the same criticisms we've been having of these edge screens for a while. It's you know like to avoid any kind of touching of the display where your camera viewfinder is, you start doing this really light fingertip hold and the new camera app has a zoom where you slide Ooh. the shutter button up or down, which means if you're trying to just rapidly touch for a couple different shots, <laughs> like especially if you're shooting in manual mode, you're very likely not perfectly perpendicular tapping on the screen. You might have like a little flick mm. up. And if you do that, it doesn't actually take the photo. It then initiates part of a zoom. And <laughs> it, it's like you have to be even more careful in how so, you so gingerly funny. touch Man. parts. It It is a little twitchier than the S7 was. I, and again, this is a muscle memory issue more than anything else. Like, I am not used to this phone. I've had it for less than 48 hours. But I did not have this retraining this retraining wasn't necessary going from the s6 to the s7 that was mm. baller and even for the day that i got to play with a note 7 um same thing like i didn't have this kind of like relearning like just barely holding it on the edges of my fingertips and then having to interact with slightly more precise pieces of software so all in all, this has still been giving off a very positive first impression, but there are a lot of philosophical questions that I hope Samsung can address over the life of this particular I'm kind phone. of getting paranoid about how many times I've used my filler word uh, or words, you know, uh, you know, um, but, um, but, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, at this, but I'm going to ask my question anyways, because... The, the, do it uh, d- um, do it have, so do does it. the length of the phone um uh, like ha- make you consider the uh holding it in new ways because um i've been able to find that uh like a like a weird off like this upside grip where it's you know you hold the phone this way like a coffee mug and then um yeah. you just tilt it over and then uh, assist with as needed uh, with the volume buttons with the other hand like um that seems like a decent idea for for a grip but i i don't particularly know what kind of so, situation so you're you're i think i think you're you're totally right there and i think the G6 is a little easier to do that with and i think the regular sized or the smaller S8 is going to fit right in line with that kind of operation the S8 plus starts to get just that little bit bigger that little bit taller 
that it's just still not quite as handy to do that kind of phone twisting, turning, shifting. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of along, a lot of this also comes down to the fact that I think the LG is just easier to hold on to because of the flat sides. Mm-hmm. So it's not like this phone is so much thinner than a G, not like the S8 Plus it's just is the so flat much thinner than surface a G6. On, it just yeah. feels, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's because of the tapers, the symmetrical glass on the front and back of the S8 Plus that it feels so much thinner. But because of that, I really do feel like in these first two days, so much more of my operation is balancing this phone on my fingertips. Because I know I'm going to have to reach up if I want to use the fingerprint sensor. I know I'm going to have to slide down to hit the home button from my thumb. I know I'm going to have to slide back up or flip the phone flat for my thumb to reach the notification shade, or if I want the fingerprint sensor to use the notification shade, which I totally (laughs) screwed up in my 24 hour uh, first look. It's like, I couldn't find the setting. And I was looking at all the fingerprint, uh, the fingerprint security settings, and there was no option there for using the fingerprint sensor to pull the notification shade. And it's in a, just, it's in a different menu. So that's permanently baked into that video. Please go to the pocket now YouTube channel and make fun of me there. Cause I totally let me, let me pull it up here. Um, (laughs) no jules should be doing this right now (laughs) look at that dork um so i this phone makes me nervous because it comes from a land down under and and, and actually um yes it does Uh, yeah you if you're Um, watching the video that's one of the clips for the audio test like and you said and there aren't any like real full body like plastic cases for that yet but Oh, there, there, there are actually. Um, we've got a pretty good relationship with uh, oh. VRS Design, and I, they're going to be sending us out some cases just to kind of um, incorporate into some of our other reviews. It's just again, the phone's so brand spanking new that I think a lot of those PR reps are trying to push to different mm-hmm. producers. Um, in, in fact, we might be bringing on a new Pocket Now team member soon, and hopefully, Ooh. he can start digging into more of the accessories that. that why back why, our why haven't up. I been told about um, this? I this you're you're just getting the scoop now. I mean, we've been trying to engage in a few conversations with some other YouTubers and some other people that we'd want to partner with, and we're just now starting to get to that point. So hopefully by uh, by next week, maybe uh, he'll even be able to join yeah, us on the man, Pocket Now get, Weekly. It's uh, just another little stoked, tease people. there. So yeah, this is a. I mean, well, I, I want to go back to your uh, 24 hour uh, first impressions because I do want to include the sense that it it's not. Um, all brimstone and, and fire and you know there's definitely some cream and chrome like Ratatat has described oh yeah and 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 a lot of this i mean again it, we we got a couple of very frustrated comments like we were just throwing shade part of doing a 24 hour video isn't necessarily just to be wow and impressed by an unboxing i didn't get the box <laughs> to be um, impressed by an unboxing it's it's to start asking some of the questions that we need to examine as we go through the review process and so against phones like the G6 or the V20 or a Huawei Mate 9 Samsung is asking me to change my behavior and how I handle a phone if I want to use the phone naked or I'm going to have this beautifully designed device. This is one of the most beautifully constructed pieces of consumer electronics you have ever seen when you handle it in person. But I'm going to have to cover it up with a case or put some kind of skin on it for better grip, else it's just a really big bar of slick, slippery soap. So that's a part of that review process. We have to start asking some of those questions and looking at what is it that changes our behavior? And this is one of the things like I've not been a huge fan of curved glass and glass on glass design since I smashed yeah. a Note 5. Um, that's the only phone I've ever broken during a review. I've, I've, I've scratched some phones. I've dented some phones. It's the only phone I've rendered completely inoperable and from a pretty minor drop. So I've been very anxious about this kind of design philosophy. And this phone doesn't really change my opinion of that. But now I have to look at what is it that is changing about my behavior when I use this phone, and especially when I use this phone very aggressively, like shooting the real camera review or taking it out and trying to do some uh, water resistance tests mm. or something like that. Um, and, and I don't have those same concerns with the G6. Um, I, I know ratings or whatever, you know, you can still smash a G6, you can still break it, but there's just that little extra peace of mind with the mil spec rating. And 
I don't feel like I'm really changing my grip on the phone from the V20 or from a Mate 9 because of the flat sides on the G6. So again, it's just the 24 hours is my first part of the review process and then we'll be able to examine those questions and find the pros and cons and and celebrate i think celebrate a bit more of the phone after we've gotten more of a chance to get used to it we weren't in on the early pre-embargo stuff so a lot of the reviews that are out there are from people that have already spent probably a week or more with the yeah. phone you know i'm i'm still playing catch up there this is still brand so spanking there's new. a lot of coping going on compared to other devices that you've used this is the most uh you would think uh that you've had done you and and not the most for pocket now because you know um jaime spent almost all of his time with samsung nearly exclusively on the s7 edge you know i didn't spend any time with the s7 edge and i i did get a note and I got the note days before the major <laughs> recall on the note. So I'm coming. My last my last long term use Samsung phone was the regular flat front S7. So that's that is kind of a little bit of a, of a sea change. You know, if you were coming from an S6, a flat front S6, not an S6 Edge, or a Note 5, a flat front Note 5, and then you came over to this S7, there is a little behavior modification in how you go about using the phone. Now, I think for a lot of our audience, especially the people that flip their phones more frequently, this isn't going to be a difficult acclimation. But I'm looking at, you know, like my mom's on an, a Galaxy S5. I don't know that the S8 is going to be a phone she's really going to enjoy for the way that she's been using her S5. So it's those little things. Or like my dad is still on a, a Galaxy mm. Alpha. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's small. like the little mini baby <laughs> Note 4 design. Those those hard metal flat edges and that the was rubbery backplate. I don't think he's... I loved that phone. I really wish they had kept up with that because I, I just love the Note 4 design language in general. Um, but I don't know that he's really going to dig the S8 coming from a phone like that. So, again, it, it, it's it's I'm not worried about our audience. And our audience is already like <laughs> a lot of the people that are leaving comments, especially are people who already own it, <laughs> already own the S8. And they're coming to, to just sort of join it. the conversation. Oh. It, it's more. Or not, and and I, I hope it's not really coming across like I'm trying to poop yeah. all over this phone because I'm not. It's just this is this is something that's fresh for me, and this is something that's new for me. And I'm also trying to look at this from the perspective of other members of my family, other friends of mine. I think we take it for granted that we're just gonna get used to some of these changes, and I think there are a few things about this device. Not that I would ever say that this should take the device out of a purchasing recommendation, but there are a few things about this device that I think are gonna be a challenge for some users mm. out there. Interesting. Um, another. Uh, I, I don't mean to pile on this whole ergonomics aspect, but one of the feature. Oh no! Please, please do because I think this is a yeah. fun debate. You know what I mean? Like. Like it's a fun thing to kind of well, sink your I mean, teeth well, into. It's, it's a debate because I'm asking, I'm asking you the questions, but I don't get to ask like the other side, I guess, questions, like because they're not here, right? right, right but right. um, they're <laughs> and they, they might not even exist. exist. Who knows? <laughs> Disappear. Disappear. <laughs> anyway, so um, one of the big feature paradigms that was introduced with the edge is the edge feet, like you'd swipe away uh, the edge screen. And um, you would have all the mm -hmm. tools, like contacts and, and other apps and whatnot. Um, how have you been able to get along with that feature if you ever use it at all? Because um, one of the features that I enjoyed from uh, Chris Lacey's Action Launcher, and I believe maybe or maybe not um, a OnePlus has implemented, but it was like an instant shelf where you, from any point – uh, in on the phone, no matter if you were on the home screen or mm -hmm. uh, in an app, you would be able to swipe the shelf and get access to any app that you would need. So um, that I feel like would be. So I haven't been the biggest fan of Edge because I, I, I do somewhere in my bookcase full of crazy old phones. I, I do have an S6 mm -hmm. Edge Plus. Um I actually haven't been the biggest fan of that kind of UI addition. 
So I am going through, I'm still setting up, like I just got all my apps last night on my second homepage uh, set up the way that I normally would. And I'm right now, I'm trying to simplify. I used to be that guy who had seven full homepages and I kind of whittled that down to five and then I kind of whittled it down to three and now I'm down to two. And I like trying to streamline what I can get to. And a part of that is because my usage is very not like your average consumers where the muscle memory of navigating a phone kind of needs to stay the same no matter what phone I'm on just so that I don't drive myself crazy. So I, I'm still in the process of setting up the edge panel on this phone, but so far I just don't see where that kind of add-on really gets me to the services that I need or the contacts that I want to communicate with in any more efficient way than just a, a, a smart, streamlined approach to customizing mm -hmm. a home screen panel. So there's so much kind of going on right now where I'm looking at Huawei was actually the company that made me start taking a look at this because there were so many extra steps involved <laughs> in navigating <laughs> Huawei menus. And you're like, there's got to be a way to kind of clean this up. And then over EMUI 5, they've They've done a better job, but there are still a few things like you've buried this setting three menus deep and you didn't really need to. So if I'm going to pull the edge panel, you know, that it's a gesture and it's a gesture which honestly might not always be perfectly executed. And then you slide through the edge panel to get to the piece of information that you want. Whereas if I've already customized my home screens for the most used services and the most contacted contacts that I've got, I hit the home button. You know, you know like in, in terms of like programming muscle memory and what I'm getting used to for myself personally, that's that to me is sort of the most straightforward approach for how I can live my life while also being a gadget reviewer. <clears throat> and again, like, should I be trying to minimize even just re repositioning the phone in my hand um, to in interact with different parts of the hardware or software? So that's where I'm kind of stuck. Like I've disabled Bixby from the home screen. Mm -hmm. So like when I slide to the right, it doesn't pull up Bixby there because I just want my home screens to be my home screens. I'll play with the edge panel. I'm not, I don't okay. think it's going to be something so, I stick um, with. We have all those kinds of, um, th those elements where it's just dealing with the hand feel of the phone. Uh, I want to move on uh, in the short time we have left to uh, some of the uh, audio visual components of it. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, let's definitely. just go through the camera because I think you're in the middle of your process for that right now. So far, so good. Yeah. So far, so far, very good. Um, it, this isn't going to be revolution uh, for Samsung. I, I think if you were on an S7 or an S7 Edge. Uh, you probably won't be seeing tremendous differences in the photo and video output from the S8. A couple key things that I've already seen, because I've, I've done mostly all of my night shots, so low light photography, night shots. Um, the one thing I'm going to give a thumbs up is that we do seem to have a slightly better okay. lens on the S8. It's not quite as flare prone as what we saw on the S7. And then a lot of the changes, I think, are coming down more to image processing, more than some kind of radical hardware improvement. This does use a different camera sensor than the S7, but what I'm noticing is more um, Samsung, I, I think following in the footsteps of what like uh, the Pixel is really good at. Not, ne not necessarily in taking multiple photos, but in using software algorithms to help reduce noise, bring up more detail, um, better contrast, better color, better clarity. And this isn't radical departure from the S7, but it genuinely seems to be improved across the board. Um, when, when you look at just sort of a shot from the hip, mm -hmm. quick photo here, it's the middle of night on a busy street. So you're, you're lit by street lamps. And then you look at the photos and you're like, oh, the S8 actually did deliver a better photo in that kind of auto mode in the moment kind mm -hmm. of uh, okay. situation. So de definitely um, it works where it, it counts the most, I guess you could say right now. It's an it's an improvement where it counts the most. I don't think the S7, I, you know, I think okay. the S7 still works there, you know, especially if you've got a pretty good feel for your phone camera. The only other major difference that I've been able to find is uh, video. Now, while shooting UHD, there is an option to software crop. 
so that you can further use software stabilization in addition to the hardware stabilization. I haven't shot a lot with that yet, so I'll be curious to see if that really does help improve um, Handshake or if it's going to be the same sort of weird distortion that I find when you use a combination of software I'm, and hardware stabilization. I'm, I'm actually not a big fan of that. I have with um, the sensor and the frame because it's if it's 3860, um, yeah. I'm, I think it's 13 megapixels. So, okay, we're talking about like 5,000 ish and, um, you know, 3,000 plus whatever. Yeah, it's it's a it's a twelve okay, megapixel 4, sensor, and so that eight megapixel image. Yeah, it's it's a pretty yeah, small okay. window, but we've seen where the Pixel and the iPhone deliver phenomenal software stabilization by punching in to that four thousand pixel border, and so Samsung could stand to improve there. My big problem is with hardware stabilization always on. That means mm-hmm. the lens is wobbling. You know, the lens is compensating for the movement of the phone. That does create optical distortions. Yeah. You know, you see it a lot on LG phones, right? You go handheld and you see those big jello swings because there's such a huge range of image stabilization on an LG. There's a, there's a smaller range of stabilization on a Samsung. But there is still optical distortion happening. So when you have mm-hmm. those wobbles happening and then you crop, <laughs> this is the worst hand jive I've ever done on camera. But then you crop that image in, the the software yeah. is panning to compensate for movement and the lens is wobbling. So you often arrive at this kind of stuttery okay. <laughs> wobble. A multi-step <laughs> wobble. Like it's hard that, to describe in words. The, 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 like the pixels are all of a sudden yeah okay they're kind of moving right. waves so your background stands to be just a little bit smoother but then you still see the swings of the lens in distorting the field of view and i think that that effect is less pleasant than if you okay. just had a little extra right. handshake in your video you know like it, you know you look at a huawei and that's probably i think the busiest looking video of any phone from this year and i would still probably take that over the combo of software and hardware sort of mucking with the scene i think it makes it look kind of uh, are we talking about uh too much is a good uh, too much of a good thing in this case uh for the s8 in particular i you know it, it, it's I don't think it's a situation of too much good things because I don't think <laughs> okay. it's ever looked good. <laughs> I don't think this isn't this isn't unique to Samsung. A lot of companies, especially mm-hmm. when you shoot HD video, will combo hardware and software. And I don't think it's ever looked good. Um, so this is just a, something we need to test is does Samsung have a better solution for this? Like, is their software processing better? Or if we're going to use software stabilization, should we be more focused on like the pixels implementation of it where there is no hardware image stabilization, but that video in good light comes out buttery smooth. That video in medium Mm -hmm. to low light looks really artifacty. You know, it, as the software is trying to compensate for the longer shutter speed of each individual frame, you get blurry streaky things happening it doesn't really smooth the video out very well. So again, it's all it's all compromises. You know, where do we want to put that compromise? And honestly, I think more people will probably land on the Samsung version of the compromise. Like if I were to just show you a blind taste test of low light pixel video and low light mm-hmm. Samsung video, I think more people would probably like the low light okay. Samsung video. Um, but it's still something that we need to take a look at because I think in good light, the pixel video would probably okay. win. So we're we're expecting that uh, real camera <clears throat> review tomorrow, I believe, or or sometime in the future. Uh, I, I'm I'm gonna try and get it out tomorrow. It it might end so, up dropping over the weekend, but it, it will be coming when in the next this, day. Or two, uh, yeah. Podcast drops as well, so by that time, maybe you'll have different judgments of uh, what this uh, camera can do. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> yeah. It's like tune back in because the mm, the analysis will yeah, blow it's, your it's mind. Gonna, you're gonna say the exact opposite of what you're talking about in this uh, podcast, so. It's going to be the best. <laughs> Everything is going to be. The I totally should. I um, totally should. Let's, uh, let's uh, <laughs> almost wrap this up with uh, audio. Day. Now, um, we do have a unique situation. Um, yes. Just to gloss over. I mean, I don't want to gloss over, but um, there is a bigger issue with the 
the summarize. There we go. To That's summarize, the word. Um, better audio, not the best. Uh, in- internals are are better than before, and kind of closing in on the upper mid range. You would say uh, speakers are just the same ish uh, because oh, of definitely. the mono situation. So. So, so uh, I think that we, 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 uh, I tried to address all of those in the exact same sentence. All the same time. Um, let, let, let's start with the speakers. So we, we have the real audio review and we go into a little bit more depth and we actually have like our charts and graphs and stuff so that you can see what's going on to summarize the real audio review TLDR, um, over the S7, I do hear not, not a humongous, but a noticeable improvement in quality. Um, because the S7 speaker was pretty weak. Um, I thought the S7 was a step down from the S6. The S8, I think, would be a very minor improvement over the S6. And that's important because the common knowledge was uh, waterproofing a phone makes the speaker less good. And LG and Apple have bro- both disproven that, and now Samsung has finally caught back up. So that's definitely something that we want to give them the thumbs up on getting back on track there. Uh, the headphone output, um, again, we're coming at this from the Qualcomm-powered Samsungs. I don't think the Exynos-powered Samsungs have had as many issues. But in North America, we get Qualcomm, and they kind of use just whatever normal audio settings come with that chipset. And it's always been n- closer to the bottom end of the smartphone spectrum. Uh, this now gets us back up into competitive territory against iPhones. Um, which is which is a very a positive step for Samsung. Much better signal to noise ratios. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, for for all of my griping about Apple, it's you know, they still deliver a, a a respectably high quality audio stream even through that ridiculous dongle adapter that they've got mm. for the Lightning connector. Um, so what's funny is, and I, I mentioned this specifically in the real audio review. What's funny is that this is all positive. For a company like Samsung, you know this is improvement. This this is a better audio output for the headphone jack, and it gets it. It's nearly identical to the output from the LG G6, where a lot of people are griping about the LG G6 because it's a step down from the LG V20, and only a few select markets are going to get the V20 DAC in the G6, where we know the V20 is still one of the the best headphone phones ever created. So I just think it's a funny perspective where any minor improvement to a North American galaxy is kind of a big positive deal. And it's the almost exactly the same output from the G6, which has been a negative talking point for a lot of the people who leave uh, and, comments uh, on our videos. There is uh, There are some talking points we want to... Um... I don't know, trade bats with uh, maybe if we want to get into uh, our discussion about the AKG uh, situation. So um, if you if you will, if you will, yeah, what's uh, going on with the, the bundled in earphones from AKG? So this dun, 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 this dun, 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 dun. is breaking news. This is bleeding edge commentary. Dun, 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 dun. Um, no, so we put out uh, the 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 day I got the phone. I I was right on task to do the real audio review. And while I was digging into that, I felt it was just sort of it was worth splitting off the headphone commentary as a separate review. And and I'm glad we did because it 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 sort of needed its own video space, not to just be lumped in with the rest of the phone video review stuff that we're, we've been doing. Sorry, excuse me. So uh, they're very high quality earbuds. Uh, Samsung saying that they're going to sell them for $99. And I think they compete well against other sort of uh, fashionable branded earphones, ear, ear, uh, earbuds that are around that same price territory. Like in terms of actual output quality, I would put them up near, say, the B and O uh, plays mm. that I've got with the V20, and those retail for around 150. So those H3s are are not cheap. Um, I I think Samsung's in spitting distance of that. I, I like the B and Os better. Um, I, I think the highs on the B and Os could be a little bit more sparkly and a little more playful. But um, I think Samsung's right in line with this pricing, and and I would say that they're competitive against other manufacturers like a V Moda, where V Moda earbuds can often run around 100. dollars now, what bothers me, and what we put out a video today, after we released the AKG earbud review, we got a message from a Samsung PR rep saying that our review was a little inaccurate because these are not AKG earbuds. They're Samsung earbuds tuned by AKG. 
And that disclosure actually did bother me a little bit because there's huge mm. AKG branding on the earbuds. All of Samsung's primary uh, discussion points have said that these are earbuds from AKG. That That's exactly what they said what, exactly in the what Unpacked Mr. event that we went to in, out in, in New York. <laughs> <laughs> right. And... and that that type of disclosure means something to me because AKG is one of my all-time favorite audio brands. My absolute favorite studio microphone is the AKG C414. This is a company that has set the gold standard for recording and professional audio uh, electronics since the late 60s, I believe. And so this makes me a little nervous with Samsung yeah. owning the parent company of AKG being so cavalier with that branding that these are not AKG so, uh, yeah, this, earbuds after yeah. all. And that that also the tone from Samsung PR was that we should have known this. We didn't know this, not because we didn't do our homework. We didn't know this because it really hasn't been disclosed in that way. You know, this 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 really I, I don't feel like, you know, you have the AKG logo on the earbuds that we're supposed to assume that this is not AKG hardware, that this is Samsung hardware. And so that that the way that this was sort of illustrated to us, I so, found to be a little problematic. I mean, we want to let's let's go back as a step here. So Samsung did uh, recently close its acquisition of Harman, which among uh, all of its brands, including Harman Kardon, and That's right. it has AKG. JBL is also I in think there. JBL. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, they own JBL but too. AKG yeah. is also one of them. And, you know, there is there is some sort of, you know, arm that you put out uh, for distance um, just to uh, say that what they do is not what we do and so on and so forth. But there is also that kind of um, desire to uh, bring them in partnership and, you know, leverage all of their expertise and whatnot to um, – show a strong yeah. combined brand or, you know, to strengthen both. Yeah, it's a win-win for Samsung. They didn't have the best audio reputation and they want to start capitalizing on their acquisition financially but it doesn't as seem quickly as possible. exactly fair in its representation to just, okay, so there's the we're dealing with part-tight companies and, you know, we can um blow them away if we have to absolutely like like we can just push them away so I, i'm really getting a sort of mixed sense of of who they are they're still separate entities i think still in this like at this moment yeah i mean this acquisition still has still has fresh ink on it, right? You know, you can still smudge <laughs> the, the signatures from all parties involved. That's that's how recent that that this uh, this move was finally approved. Because uh, I'm with you too. This does not change my opinion of the quality of the accessory, which is included in the box. But this does annoy me a little as a branding and labeling exercise because I feel Samsung is not properly disclosing to consumers what this relationship actually is. And we have a nearly identical situation that we can point mm -hmm. to with the LG V10. The V10 came with earbuds that were tuned by AKG and have LG logos on them because LG made those headphones and then reached out to AKG for all of the final like special magic sauce that went into making those good earbuds. We don't have any confusion as to what that relationship was. And I feel Samsung is not in any kind of criminal sense or not in kind of any duplicitous sense, but I feel like they're misrepresenting exactly what you're getting in the box by putting the like, by, if, by it's branding your, if it's yours the like earbuds take credit um, like we, we don't mind it's it, it's good good on you for making a yeah. decent pair of uh of, of uh, earbuds but you you know to entire say that entirely yeah uh made of an it was all an akg effort i that's that's what's so frustrating is I don't think it diminishes the reputation or the product in the slightest to say that these are Samsung designed, you know, premium custom fit, <laughs> you know, not custom fit, but, you know, like a premium inner aural, super high quality earbuds that would sell retail for a hundred dollars. And already as a part of our partnership with Harman, we reached out for them to do the final 
pairing so that these earbuds were specifically designed to showcase the power of the new Galaxy S8 audio processing units on board. I mean, like, that's just such a an organic way to talk about this relationship that it's a it is kind of frustrating to me that that's not what they did. And and in the in the uh, sort of rebuttal video, <laughs> it's not even a rebuttal video. It's the correction video that we put out for this for this situation. Like I actually included the mm-hmm. clip of the Samsung Unpacked event where they they say these are from AKG, and that wording means something different to me than these are Samsung premium earbuds that were tuned by AKG. Uh, that that's something very different to me as as someone who who still has a love of high quality and professional audio uh, recording gear from my Sennheiser headphones to my blue microphones and everything else in between. And I don't mean blue Yetis. I mean, like my two thousand dollar blue Kiwi and my thousand dollar blue blueberry um, that. That that's a distinction that I still hold to be very important. One that I don't think changes any kind of purchasing recommendation for consumers, but it makes me less accurate in how I'm talking about these products, especially for the few people in our community who do care about that level of distinction and that level of accuracy. So uh, uh, one of these days, kit. I'm going to uh, go fly to uh, Shenzhen and uh, order a whole bunch of uh, generic odium earbuds uh and then you know have them plaster the pocket now logo on them and then i'm going to fly back over and uh, drive down to uh, manchester connecticut to meet up with uh harman and an akg or whatever and just basically pass through uh, tuning the tuning processes from all of their associated brands and right then we can go to market and say that <laughs> and the, like... the pocket now uh, freaking Earbuds are the best. They've earbuds been tuned by are all, like fifteen hundred like, um, man hours of of <laughs> genius. I was gonna, I was say, man, <laughs> damn, Jules, that's elaborate. That's great. <laughs> but you know, it, it there there are a bunch of bad comparisons we can make. I mean, it's like if if I buy a Toyota and just put a Lexus badge on it, do I have the same thing? And and some of the some of the some of those comments, I don't really feel have been quite fair to the value of Samsung's premium ear earbud. You have you have the metrics. It's past the placebo. It's not the exact. It's past the placebo. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. It's just, this is again, I mean, like I, I keep wanting to stress for me, this is a frustration of branding and labeling. And also because I very much care about that AKG label. I, I can't I can't stress that enough. I love their professional recording equipment. I love their mixing gear. I love their DJ gear. This is a company that I've grown up with in the world of recording, and I don't like seeing that branding tossed around so cavalier because there's a trust. There's a trust in me expecting something from those three letters that I can't get somewhere else. Same thing with Sennheiser. Same thing with Shure. Same thing with Audio-Technica. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Sony. I have an expectation. And if I just start seeing the letters AKG popping up on whatever Samsung wants to slap them on, very quickly that brand is going to fall by the wayside well, for me. And I'm that's glad not I'm not aware of any Samsung uh, toasters flying around the Walmart locally. So. <laughs> <laughs> or just like a you know a Samsung Wi-Fi connected toaster with <laughs> AKG speakers, toaster in. radios. It's Man, amazing. were they a thing back in the eighties? I guess maybe they were a thing. I don't, I'm not sure. Said, said no one ever. Said no so one. let's um. Uh, what do you? So overall, <laughs> at this point, you've had it for a couple of days now. Um, the S8. Uh, what? What's your? Yeah. What's your going on biggest full day takeaway two. from this uh, so far? Overall, this is a very this is a very positive first forty eight hours. Um, again, one of the most stunningly beautiful devices I think we've we've ever had the pleasure of reviewing at Pocket. Now, the aesthetics I don't think anyone would call into question. The big questions I have for the review process are. How much potential will we really see realized from this change in form factor? 
And it's going to be a difficult conversation for us to have. It's going to be a difficult question to answer because it can't come just from that first review. Um, we still have to wait for the final update to Bixby, including more voice controls. And we have to see what app developers really start embracing these taller screens. Because um, right now the solution is to stretch apps, which means certain things get cut off in the corners. Will we see developers embrace this hardware within the life of this phone? Or are we buying a product with potential that might never be fully realized? And that's always sort of a difficult idea to examine. So none of this is FUD. None of this is me saying like you shouldn't be hyped up about this phone or you shouldn't be jumping on board. I know a lot of people who have already picked their phones up and are having overwhelmingly positive experiences with their S8 purchase. It's still something that I want to take a look at philosophically because I feel like something has to start changing in the world of smartphones. And I don't know if taller screens are really the killer app that we've all been lacking from our smartphone usage is this just going to be another step in the right direction? And eventually, and that's something we're just we going to get visors and just have all our content in like ten by one. You you know me, man. If we could go straight to neural oh, okay. and just plug directly into my optic nerve, I'm ready. Sign me up. Let's do this. <laughs> well, in that case, yeah, let's properly end this. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Jules as at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web on social media, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com. We're basically everywhere. And shows like this cannot exist without your support by sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and by dropping reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever podcast reviews can be left. Once again, we want to thank this week sponsor Blue Apron. They're helping us keep the lights on and they're helping me keep my stomach filled with delicious food. But ultimately there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. Music